Thank you, everybody, for coming to the Aaron Torres Podcast YouTube page. I do have one quick favor before we get to the video that you came here for, and that is very simply this. You see that little red subscribe button below this video? Go ahead, smash that subscribe button. It really does help me. It really does help this channel grow and my audience grow. So go ahead and hit that red subscribe button. And now, here is the video that you came here for. So with that said, let's now get into the official topic of the day. And it's our old buddy Lincoln Riley. And so here's, so here's the deal on this topic. Is one, I've seen some people kind of talking about it on the internet, some writers writing about it, all that good stuff. But I was on a radio show not too long ago, the last couple days, and somebody asked me a point blank question. They said, is Lincoln Riley a new college football villain? And I thought about it, and we talked about it on that show, and I wanted to bring it to the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast because one, I think it's a great topic, and two, I think Lincoln Riley is a new college football villain. We've been talking a lot about villains in this college football offseason. Jimbo Fisher appears to emerge have has appears to have emerged as one. And I believe Lincoln Riley has done the same. And I think this is nothing but good for college football as there is clear animosity, at least in SEC country right now for Texas A&M. And there is clear animosity for Lincoln Riley and what we believe he is doing in the transfer portal and tampering and all that good stuff. So first of all, let, let's just get into, because a couple of you are probably sitting there, you know, you're at the gym, you're driving around, you're sitting there thinking, why would Lincoln Riley be, be a villain? And I think it's pretty straightforward. I think it's everything that he's basically done over the last six, seven, eight months. I mean, one, he leaves a, a blue blood, you know, blue chip, top 10 job in college football for Oklahoma, Oklahoma for USC. So that in and of itself upset a huge portion of the Oklahoma fan base, if not all of the Oklahoma fan base. But two, it was really how he did it. And by the way, I don't know Lincoln Riley. He seemed like a nice enough guy when I had a chance to interact with him at USC's media day. But at the same time, why I bring it up is because uh, it's not just that Lincoln Riley left Oklahoma for USC, it's how he did it. Remember, he, w he had been linked to that LSU job for really several, several, several weeks prior to his departure. Not USC, I'm now, I'm talking about LSU. This was prior to his departure from Oklahoma. And if you remember, he went to the podium the night of the Bedlam game, the night after you lose to your biggest rival, and he goes, I am not leaving Oklahoma to be the head coach at LSU. You can print it, you can write it, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he basically said, I am not leaving Oklahoma for LSU. And then 12 hours later, he goes to USC. One, I kind of think that's a gangster move, but two, it clearly upset a lot of people and clearly the way he handled it. I would say this from the Oklahoma perspective as well. I think there were a lot of people that were clearly upset even how he handled that whole process to begin with. One, he kind of was asked a question about LSU a few weeks before that Bedlam game. He kind of ducked the question. But I have a buddy who's an Oklahoma fan that really said the last two, three weeks, Oklahoma had a very late buy in the season. They come off their buy. They lose to Baylor. That was the game where Caleb Williams gets hurt. He's briefly benched for Spencer Rattler. Comes back in. They end up losing to Baylor. They go take care of Iowa State in a close, low-scoring game. And then in the final game of the season, they end up losing to Oklahoma State. So even before he officially left, there were a lot of Oklahoma fans that said, something doesn't really feel right here. He didn't really answer that question a few weeks ago about the LSU job. Uh, something doesn't feel good. And then he goes to the podium and says, I am not going to be the LSU coach. And then 12 hours later, goes to coach USC. And so I think from the Oklahoma fan base perspective, they're like, dude, this guy had one foot out the door for a while. Don't give us this, oh, you know, I didn't, even, I didn't even communicate with USC until well after the Bedlam game on that Saturday night. Listen, it ain't my business what you do. It ain't my business why you left Oklahoma for USC. But the fact remains, everybody knows that on the way out the door, you were a little bit sketchy. And then on top of that, it's everything that he's done since he got to USC. First of all, to go back to the Oklahoma thing for a second, remember the whole transfer portal stuff back when he first got to USC. He takes the job in early December. Caleb Williams, a bunch of Oklahoma players, most of the Oklahoma players, except for Spencer Rattler, Austin Stogner, one or two other guys, end up sticking around playing in the bowl game. And I think at that point, there was a lot of belief that there was a good chance that all these guys might stay, that Caleb Williams might stay, that Mario Williams might stay. And then all of a sudden, they're on campus for three weeks, they play in the bowl game, and then the season ends, and then they have some free time, and then all of a sudden after that, Caleb Williams decides to hit the transfer portal. 
Mario Williams, the wide receiver, decides to hit the transfer portal. Latrell McCutcheon, really good cornerback who I think will start at USC next year from Oklahoma, decides to enter the transfer portal. And so you have how he left Oklahoma. You have the fact that some of his players seem to be on a weird timeline where they're going to stay at Oklahoma, and then all of a sudden they decide to leave. And then, of course, you have the Jordan Addison stuff this week. And I understand the frustration of everybody who's not a USC fan with this situation with Jordan Addison. The bottom line is you can say whatever you want about we don't have proof that Lincoln Riley was tampering or that his staff was tampering and Jordan Addison has a pre-existing relationship with Caleb Williams and all that good stuff. Here's what I would say. First of all, this is not his first tampering accusation, as I said on Monday's show. Last year around this time, there was a star-wide receiver at Arkansas who goes through spring practice at Arkansas named Mike Williams. Uh, Mike Williams, Mike Woods, excuse me, is seemingly happy. And then all of a sudden, all all out of nowhere, after spring ball, he ends up hitting the portal, transferring to Oklahoma. Then you have the Caleb Williams, Mario Williams situation. And then you had the Jordan Addison situation where we get reports that he's thinking about entering the portal. And before he even gets in, he's already being linked to USC. So you can tell me that there was no tampering involved and maybe there wasn't. But at the same time, You know who thought there was tampering involved? The Pitt coaching staff. Pat Narduzzi called Lincoln Riley. He called Lincoln Riley multiple times on Friday to voice his displeasure. So you could tell me that there's no proof that there was tampering. My proof is that this is not the first time with Lincoln Riley and that the Pitt coaching staff thought there was something funky enough going on that they had to call Lincoln Riley themselves. So to me, yes, I believe Lincoln Riley is a villain. That is, that is, well, let me even backtrack. That's kind of my explanation as to why I would argue that he's a villain. And now here is why he definitively is. Because to me, a villain, it, there, there's a couple elements that go into being a villain, especially in college sports. First of all, as I just said with Lincoln Riley, I'm not saying that he's an egregious rule breaker. I'm not saying he's even a rule breaker at all. But in college sports, most of the guys that are considered villains, if they're not definitively a rule breaker... They certainly push those rules to the limit, which is what Lincoln Riley has done with the tampering and what he's done with all sorts of different stuff. He's starting to push those limits where I'm not saying he's definitively done anything, but you can't just say that it's a total coincidence that three different schools now, Pitt, Oklahoma, and Arkansas, have basically accused him of tampering. And so I believe that he's a villain because, one, he's pushing the bounds of what the rules are, if not breaking them outright, just like most college sports villains, by the way. It's what Barry Switzer did at Oklahoma many, many years ago. This is what Rick Pitino did at Louisville. John Calipari at Memphis. Um, You know, even Coach K, right? Like Coach K, there were a lot of reasons that he became a villain. But part of it was, it felt like at the end, is this guy really playing by the rules? Zion's parents are living in a, whatever, a 10-bedroom mansion in Durham and nobody wants to look into that? So even Coach K, Coach K never broke a rule, but it was kind of like, eh, there's something not right going on here. John Calipari, for 10 years he's been at Kentucky, 12, 13 years now, and I keep getting told that he's breaking rules. I don't have any proof he's breaking rules. Every fan base says he's paying for players. He literally came out this week in the most aggressive non-NIL stance ever, but he's a villain because other fan bases kind of don't think that he's playing on the up and up. And so, yes, I believe Lincoln Riley's a villain. And then the other thing is, and I talked about this a lot with Jimbo Fisher, is that, you know, with the Jimbo Fisher stuff and with Lincoln Riley, people say, oh, you can't be a villain. You can't be a villain because he hasn't won anything yet. Well, first of all, Jimbo Fisher won a national championship, not at A&M, but he did win a national championship. But with Lincoln Riley, I don't buy this narrative that you have to be like a multiple-time national champion to be a villain. Why? Why do you have to be a multiple-time national champion to be a villain? I mean, I, I, I used this analogy, this example a few weeks ago with Jimbo Fisher. First of all, there's Jimbo Fisher in his own right. He hasn't won anything at A&M, but he's pissed off basically most of the SEC, most of the Big 12 footprint with the recruiting success that he had this year. I think that guy's a villain. Jim Harbaugh, this was the example that I used a few months ago uh, or a few weeks ago. Jim Harbaugh is a guy that I thought he was a villain. He never really won anything until this year. Now, he wasn't a villain after a while because his tactics wore out because he didn't win anything. But think back to those first two, three years. I would say Jim Harbaugh was the biggest villain in college football for a time before he won anything. Remember when he came and he did all the satellite camps and he's going city to city hosting these camps and then he had his spring practice at IMG Academy. Remember all that? Jim Harbaugh was definitely a villain and I think it's the same with Lincoln Riley. 
it's not that he's won multiple national championships, but it's the threat of what he is going to be capable of doing, especially if he is, certainly it appears, pushing the rules to the boundaries, if not breaking them outright overall. Now, in terms of Lincoln Riley himself, listen, I don't know if this is what he wants. To me, this kind of reminds me, I don't know if you guys remember this, but LeBron James, this is actually another good example. Before LeBron ever won a title, he was a villain because of how he left Cleveland. And this kind of reminds me of that, right? Like Lincoln Riley, does he really want to be a villain? I don't think so. He kind of did that Players' Tribune tribute to Oklahoma, and that was kind of weird, and Oklahoma fans only got more mad about it. And so I'm not sure that he wants to be a villain. But do I think Lincoln Riley is a college football villain? I'm not going to lie, I kind of do, and to go back to what I've said many times and what I said about Jimbo Fisher a few weeks ago, I don't think it's a bad thing. Villains create interest. Villains make you want to watch. Villains make you want to watch even if you want them to win or lose. It doesn't matter. Who's the highest rated team in the NCAA tournament every year? It's either Duke or Kentucky. You tune in because you don't like Duke or because you love Duke or you don't like Calipari and Kentucky or you do like Calipari and Kentucky. Same in college football. You tune into Michigan because you want to see Jim Harbaugh choke on the big stage, or you don't. You tune, in, tune into Notre Dame because you either love Notre Dame and you want to see them fall apart on the biggest stage like they normally do. And so to me, when I look at this situation, I do think Lincoln Riley is a villain. I think it's good for college football. It's creating interest in the offseason. Now, I'd be mad if I was a Pitt fan, but it's creating interest in the offseason. It's creating interest in USC. It's creating interest in the Pac-12. And I'll tell you this, if he starts winning, woo! It is only going to heighten, and I do believe that, yes, Lincoln Riley – 